is Eric Fairburn, who is the CEO of Podpoint, um, who, uh, as an organization, as a company, are uh, installing uh, a charging network in the UK um, and building that out. Eric, um, please come and uh, educate us all. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, always a pleasure to follow Hamish. And uh, I think, you know, the whole of what Tesla's doing is a pretty uh, inspiring activity. So uh, I'm pretty glad to be part of, part of that industry. And actually, um, this was set up very nicely for me because the first two polls today, what's stopping you guys buying an electric vehicle? Well, that perfectly fits into what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to walk you through all of the reasons that everyone says they're not going to buy an electric vehicle and show you how they're being solved. And the second thing I'm going to do is actually the second poll. So the second poll asked, what would, did you think the percentage of electric vehicles would be by 2030? And I think the options went 5%, 10%, 15%, or 20%. Well, I would admit I'm going to talk to you about uh, the UK and Western Europe, but I'm going to tell you that the answer to that question, the correct answer to that question, is 90%. We're not going to have a small adoption of electric vehicles happening in the next few years. We're going to have the mass takeover. This is an example of a disruptive technology which is going to completely remove the internal combustion engine from the way we power our passenger vehicles. That's what I'm going to tell you all about in the next few minutes. So here we are. This was really what was on the first poll, wasn't it, really? So what are the reasons that you're not buying electric vehicles today? And the answer always comes back one of five things, really. So the answer is one combination for each of us of range, performance, choice, cost, or charging. Very rarely does anyone come up with a reason other than those five why they're not already driving an electric vehicle today. So I'm just going to walk around them, really, and show you my sort of view of what's going on in each of those spaces. So the first one is range. So another way to answer that question is EVs don't go far enough. OK, fine. Well, let's have a little, little look at that. And I think what you have to do when you think about new technologies is you have to look at where are we today, where were we very you know, in a very short historical time ago, and therefore what's the trajectory that we're on. And this, this graph really shows this. So what we've got is loosely along the bottom time, and along here you've got real-world range. And uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent. Let's talk about how far my car can actually go if I drive it like a normal human being. This is not some sort of laboratory test. Um, and, and where you've got is you know the first sort of batch, of, and we'll talk about Tesla in a minute because it's up there, but let's start talking about the ones that are at the price points that you know is generally relevant to the, the mass market so you know you've got things like leaf and zoe and i3 you know nissan uh, renault bmw and, and you've got these guys launched these cars in 20 between sort of 2011 and 2013 really and they were doing about 80 miles of range 80 miles of range is not a long way to go very valid i can't have an electric vehicle if it all it will do is 80 miles of range but then you move forward, what is only one of these is about three years. And you've got, for example, the Zoe going from doing 80 miles to doing you know, realistically 150 miles. It's not far off doubled its range in three years. And if you think about that as a growth rate, you've got a growth rate in battery technology of for the same price point, it's getting about 30% more energy capacity every year. And if you think about what happens when you have 30% growth rates in things, it's absolutely incredible how quickly these things change so so the next bit i'm thinking about is what when does the range become sufficient for nearly all of us and it's a very interesting question because the answer comes back when you survey people generally 199 miles is not far enough range 201 is plenty so there's almost this kind of um, psychological barrier that says as soon as my car does 200 miles it's suitable for me and that makes a little bit of sense when you think about it because what do you tend to do after driving for you know 200 miles that's i've been driving for three or four hours in reality what do i do i have a break i knit to the toilet i get a cost of coffee i move on that 200 miles in a single stint is actually the maximum any of us ever do we might get back in our car and do another 200 that's fine but we always take a sort of break at that point so you get this sort of dotted line across here which is all about, you know, once the car does 200 mile vehicle, it's got the utility I need to make that my main vehicle. And what you're seeing is um, Chevy Bolt already there, the, the Nissan Leaf next generation coming out already there. And of course, across the top, what Tesla realized, I think, very early on is doesn't matter what the price point is, give the customer the fundamental utility they need. They've had 200 mile range cars from day one, but at a slightly more expensive price point. So what you're really seeing here actually is how far off is the 200 mile range car at a price point which is relevant for the mass market things like the model 3 um, and the answer is we are there or thereabouts we are just about to see 
uh, on the market, 200 mile plus range vehicles at mass market prices. That's so when you say EVs don't go far enough, my answer to that is that's probably historic. We are just at the tipping point of the range of EVs is now sufficient for the majority of us. So point one of when we sort of pull this all together, if the answer is mass adoption of electric vehicles, for me is that one. So what did I just show you then? Should have introduced that one. Um, so what I just showed you then was the answer to the question, EVs are slow. So what you just saw then was on the left-hand lane of this drag strip was an Alfa Romeo um, uh, 4C. That's a 250 horsepower sports car. That is a fast piece of kit. Um, and then you saw on the one this side, a yellow one, which was another Alfa Romeo 4C. The only difference between the Alfa Romeo to nearer the camera was it was being towed by an electric vehicle. And not an electric vehicle, which is an unusual one. Actually, the electric vehicle you can buy from Hamish's bunch today and drive every day. So, so Hamish told you how you know, the fastest car in the world at the moment, 0 to 60, is an electric vehicle. Actually, that, there's just another graphic demonstration. But these aren't slightly quick vehicles. These are so fast that you can put a sports car on a trailer on the back of them and still beat it to the quarter mile. You know, any idea that electrification is in some way going to reduce our enjoyment of driving or, or is operating in a smaller envelope of performance that really again is historic i know sometimes people think electric vehicles milk floats yes but you know bring your thinking forward now electric vehicles have really got a performance at another level um, uh, i was at a conference re recently with one of the um, a number of people one of them was the ceos of one of the really um, um high-end brands of sports cars and i said you know in the short-term future where will the highest performance vehicles be powered by from your brand and he said they will be electric i see can't keep up at the high performance levels anymore so electric cars not slow quite fast there's not enough choice. Again, early market dynamic. You know, I don't want you to read every one of those, but you know, here is just about everything I could find that looks like it's coming out in the next few years, basically. So we're not, you know, there isn't every niche. The automotive market is a range of niches. You know, some of us need a city car, some of us need an SUV, some of us need a sports car. And it's really a market that's defined by those. And at, the prob uh, you know, at this stage of the market, EVs are only touching a few different niches, really. But you've only got to look at the product plans, which is coming out here, to just see that we are about to see every significant niche that you want to look at has got electric vehicles in it. So, so you know, as we're building this story up, we're dealing with costs, we're dealing with performance, we're dealing with um, choice. They're all being ticked off. And, and how about too expensive? So here's something which I think really expands the mind for a bit. At the moment, we're really worried about when does an electric vehicle hit cost parity with the internal combustion engine. And when we say cost parity, we have to mean cost parity at 200 miles of range. It can't be you know, less utility. And what, what I'm showing you here is a number of things. So, so this one here is if you do uh, an analysis of an electric vehicle today and consider total life value, so not just the purchase of the vehicle, but what am I going to spend on fuel over it, the electric vehicle is now or now about already cheaper as a whole life cost. The only problem we've got is we don't generally calculate when we go into the dealership or wherever we buy our cars, we don't say what's the total life cost of the vehicle, we say what's the sticker price. So actually we've got a bit more to do there. Um, but you've also got to then say what's the fundamental cost drivers of this technology? And the answer is the electric vehicle is a significantly simpler device, it's a cheaper device to make than an internal combustion engine vehicle with one sole exception, which is the battery. Electric vehicles were like you know, 300 moving parts versus an internal combustion engine car at 3,000 moving parts. It's a significantly simpler thing to do. So you can sort of say right, the underlying everything except the battery in electric vehicles is cheaper. So the only thing we've got to worry about is what, how do we take cost out of the battery? And again, you know, Tesla's doing that by volume. But, but really, whether you look at them or a whole range of people, number of things here. This graph here is showing um, how the cost of batteries is coming down. And if we were sort of standing in front of you in 2013, it looked like we were heading a sort of platter in how quickly the cost of battery technology could come down. But the reality was it had sort of stalled because no one was working on it. As soon as everyone started working on it, look at the angle that's coming down at. All of that 30% cost um, uh, increase in range at the same cost is shown in that one graph. And the other thing is, when you look at the world's understanding of how quickly these technology changes, the only technology change which is analogous to this in recent time is the move to solar PV. 
move your heads back five years, solar PV was way expensive on a per kilowatt hour generated. Now it's the cheapest form of generation you can have. That's the same thing that's going on in batteries. And you see, you know, the most aggressive curve that we thought would happen in 2012, and yet by 2015, smashed it, you know, everything is already here. We're heading to this position where electric vehicle batteries just no longer hold a price disadvantage. And the next thing to expand your mind is, fine, right, if batteries are improving at 30% every single year and the rest of the car is cheaper, you don't just sort of meet perfectly if the electric vehicle becomes cost parity with the internal combustion engine vehicle. You head to a position where the electric vehicle is materially cheaper than the internal combustion engine. It's fast, it goes a long way, there's plenty of choice, it's cheaper. Can you kind of see how I'm building up to this concept now, really, that this isn't a small percentage, it's not going to share the world with internal combustion. You're moving in a way that this is a disruptive technology which takes over from the previous way we've been doing things. And then the last one, I guess, is my, my specialist subject. So I didn't tell you too much about me, but um, I, I run a company called Podpoint who builds electric vehicle charging infrastructure all across the UK. Um, we've done quite a bit of it. We've got about 40,000 charging points out there. Um, so I'm going to talk to you in a little bit more detail on that. And that's quite relevant because one of the parts on the poll, which was you know, the most uh, challenging to why you're not buying electric vehicles, was charging. So let's, let's spend a little bit of time on that. The first one I've got to tell you is there is no, no electric petrol pump, and there never will be. If you think about what a petrol pump is, it's a two-minute experience. What we all do is we drive till the little yellow light comes on in our car, then we find a petrol pump and we stand next to our car and we pour hydrocarbons in at a very, very fast rate in reality. In about two minutes, your car goes from flat to full in the petrol world. You're never, ever going to replicate that in an electric vehicle world. If you do the maths on it, let's say that all cars need to do 200 miles, as I'm, I'm strongly suggesting, and you say, I want to put that from no energy in its battery up to full in its battery in two minutes, you do some maths on that, and the answer comes back. I need to put two megawatts of power into my car. And if you think about picking up the cable that allowed you to put two megawatts of power into something, you know, maybe if we took the whole front row, we could pick that cable up. But you certainly can't do it on a one-on-one on -on -one basis. And, and similarly, let, let's, you know, things aren't infinitely efficient. You know, let's assume that putting energy into a battery is 90% you know, efficient. You've then got 200 kilowatts of heat being produced. You know, these are not practical things that you can do in reality. So the first thing I have to tell you is, don't imagine that the future of electric vehicle charging looks like a petrol station. It categorically doesn't. But don't worry it's significantly better what we actually have. The reality of what you have to do to fix charging in electric vehicles is you have to build all of this stuff. There is no single solution which gets energy into our electric cars that works for everyone. You have to build this ecosystem. And this is my view of when we're all driving electric vehicles, this is where energy flows into our, into our cars. 60% of all energy flows in more at home. Generally speaking, we get home at 6, 7 o'clock at night. Our car sits stationary and doesn't move until 8 o'clock the next morning. That's the most obvious time to charge your car. And take, take yourself on this thought experiment. If in your garage you had a petrol pump, what else would you need? Every morning you'd fill your car up and it'd be full and off you'd go. You'd very rarely need anything else. So actually, electric vehicles being able to charge at home completely changes the dynamic of this. You don't think about where's the petrol station. Um, similarly, at workplace, you drive to work, you plug in at work. Again, you don't need to. You're getting back to your car. Every time you return to it, it's full because it's just sort of taking energy in, not at the same rate that a petrol pump puts energy in. But you just don't need it. 7% um, flows in at destinations, so whether I'm going to Alton Towers, a hotel, Sainsbury's, any of these locations, energy's flowing in there. And actually, en route, this is only, I think, about 3% of the future. So you do occasionally drive to Glasgow and you need to top your car up en route. So some energy will flow in at those higher flow rates, not 2 megawatts, but maybe 200 kilowatts, something like that. Um, so that is still a, thing, still a part of it. But really, it's a completely different model. Petrol stations, this bit is 100%. EVs, it's 3%. And... Don't forget EV as a top-up model. You don't drive your electric vehicle until it's empty. The only reason you're lazy and you drive your petrol car until it's empty is it's a bit of a pain going to petrol station because there's actually not many of them per capita. You haven't got one at home. If you've got electric vehicle charging at home, every time you get there, you top it up. So you're not driving 200 miles on an average a day. We all drive 30 miles a day on average. So you just put in 30 miles of energy back into your car every single night. Works really well. Um, what it does mean is... 
uh, I've got to build you quite a lot of charging points in truth. So, you know, if all of us have a home charge point, there's 35, 40 million cars in the UK. That's 35, 40 million charge points I've got to get out there. And you probably all want to share of a workplace one, share of a public one, and share of a large uh, en route network as well. So my view is I've got to build you about one and a half times the number of charging points there are cars in the world. So uh, I'm going to be quite busy for the next few years. But, but the point being, um, you know, we're really getting somewhere towards fixing this. The other point I would say on this one is if I ask people who are just joining my network of charging points, what's the most important thing in buying an electric vehicle? They all say rapid charge network, the 3%, because that's how I behaved with my last car. When I talk to them three months after they've had an electric vehicle and say, how often have you used our rapid chargers? Oh, we never use them. We don't need it to charge at home. So it really is one of these things that you, it's a different mindset and you use it differently. And actually, you know, Hamish said it really well. I've heard it said a number of times. You know, the Tesla customers, before they buy the car, how do I charge is one of the really big questions. Once they've had the car, it's why is the 4G network not powerful enough? I've heard that many times. It's true. You get used to the new way of doing things. Um, just a little bit on this as well. What does charging look like? Different everywhere, really. There isn't a single solution to it. Um, your home charge, it, it's all about putting the right charging in the right place. So depending what your natural dwell time is. I've sort of explained it, but I haven't verbalized it. But the reality is you don't travel anywhere to charge. You travel wherever it is you're going. You drive from home to work and you charge at work. You didn't go to work to charge. You went to work to work and you charged. You go to Sainsbury's. You didn't go to Sainsbury's to charge. You went to Sainsbury's to buy your shopping. So you really are matching this charging activity to the dwell time of the place you're at. So you end up with a whole range of different technologies. That sort of pie chart I showed you of where energy is flowing into your car, it's not the same everywhere. It can flow in quite slowly at home because you've got, you're there for eight hours. It can flow in a bit less slowly, but you know, still relatively slowly at work. Um, on routes, different equation, of course, you've got to flow it in quickly. But this is really building this idea of it's quite a diverse network of products, both in terms of types of charger and locations we put them in. But you have to build this ecosystem to make it work. Okay. Um, I'm being hurried up. Last few bits. So what does this mean? It means that you see charging in all sorts of these places, from car companies to leasing companies to Nestle to Heathrow to Apcoa Parking, Land Securities, all these sort of places. Charging is distributed everywhere, basically. So this is the sort of point I'm starting to get to you. Range, we talked about that. We've pretty much sorted that one. Performance, pretty much sorted that one. Choice of cars, we're not far off. Uh, cost is almost there. We're almost that EVs are going to be cheaper on the ticket price than internal combustion engine. And charging is well on its way to being sorted. It's not sorted for all of it, but it's getting there. So summing all that up, you, you really get to this slide. And um, what we're really showing you is this is, to me, the adoption curve we're into. So we've got time along the bottom here. Here we are somewhere here, late uh, you know, 2017. And this is really, I, I produced this graph when the government said we're going to ban all internal combustion engines by 2040. And I said, who cares? We were going to do that anyway. It doesn't make any difference. You know, it was free PR for the government, that one. It didn't commit to anything. We we're already on that curve. But if you've got cars are range limited, that ends here. You've got electric vehicles are more expensive than internal combustion engines. Right, that ends about 2020, at which point electric vehicles are materially cheaper. You've got things like your peer group starts questioning you in the future. You know, why are you poisoning my air by not buying an electric vehicle? That's happening in Norway today. You are socially questioned in Norway if you buy a non-electric vehicle. Then you've got things like not only is electric vehicles getting cheaper, but internal combustion engine leasing gets almost impossible. So if we've got 90% of all cars are electric by here, that means by five years earlier, you've got to fully depreciate a leased car over five years, not 10 years. The leasing price of the non-electric vehicle has to double, otherwise the maths don't work. As you get to about 2026, 20, 2027, 20, it's effectively impossible to lease a car because its residual value is dropping to zero in such a short period of time, internal combustion has to die. So you're really getting this beginning bit here is driven by range and price, which is pretty much solved. But once you get into the 2020s and this, you know, the product is cheaper and materially better, then actually other markets come in and really just give the final blow to internal combustion engines. So in answer to the question on the second poll, what percentage of electric vehicles are going to, uh, what percentage of vehicles will be electric by 2030? I'll put it to you. The answer is at least 90%. None of us will be driving internal combustion engines in that time frame. That's me. Absolutely welcome to questions. Thank you.